All right, we're going to continue the idea of confidence intervals, only this time, unlike the last section where we were talking just about confidence intervals dealing with proportions, that was like a percentage base, like how, what proportion of people have long hair, what proportion of this is, is some parameter that you were, you were talking about, we come up with the, the interval. We're now going to go ahead and use confidence intervals to estimate population mean. So are we dealing with P anymore? <coughs> New. That was, what, what did P stand for? Proportion. Proportion for the population. What's P hat? Sample proportion. Great, okay. So the sample proportion was P hat and population proportion was P. That was for the last section. Right now we're dealing with mean. Population mean, that's our, our mu. So when we say mu, we're population mean. Here's what you need for this. you need. Number one, just like any other type of math that we, any work that we do in statistics, you got to assume you're starting with a random sample. That's pretty much, I mean, everywhere you see that. So, of course, we're going to have a random sample. If it doesn't say it, it's assumed to be a random sample. Number two, hey, do you remember the symbol for the population standard deviation? I hope so. Population standard deviation. What's the symbol for population standard deviation? Sigma. It looks like a cannon. It's a cannon. Yeah. Population standard deviation, that sigma, is assumed to be known. So somewhere in your paper, it's going to tell you the population standard deviation, or it's going to say, assume the population, listen to the words I'm saying to you right now, I know you write stuff down, but it's going to say these words, assume the population standard deviation is blank. Okay? That's going to be a very, very important piece of information for you, because in the next section, you're not going to know this, and we're going to have to do something different. Are you with me on that? Well, we're not there yet, but this right here is a huge piece of information. This is going to key you in onto whether you do a z-score, which we're going to do right now, or a t-score, which I had never talked about before. That's the next section, okay? So right now we have a couple branches of, of statistics. You've got, on the one hand, here's my one hand, you've got proportions. We've already dealt with proportions, right? Go yes. Did you just do homework on proportions? You looked up z-scores, didn't you? Confidence intervals, z-scores. You do only one thing for proportions. If you have proportions, there's only one thing that you do, and you just master that in your homework. You got it? The other hand is means. In means over here, you've got two scenarios. You've got sigma, population standard deviation is known. You're going to do one thing. You've got population standard deviation is unknown. You do another thing. You with me on that? So there, there's pretty much three scenarios. Proportions, all the same. Mean. Differences. Standard deviation known, standard deviation unknown. We're dealing with the known right now. Right here, this is in 7.3, 7.4, we'll deal with unknown, okay? You guys get the kind of the, the general idea there? So proportions, bank that away. You do one thing for four proportions, this is not going to cross over whatsoever. Now we have means. Same idea as a confidence interval, so I'm not going to spend so much time talking about why we do intervals and all that. I've covered all that before. Now we're just going to do the nitty-gritty of how we make these confidence intervals to estimate our population mean. That's what this section is all about. And it stems on these three principles. First one, random sample, no problem. Second one, you know the sigma. You know the population standard deviation. And the third one, you've seen this before also. There was a magic number for n. By the way, what does n stand for again? You should all know this. Number of trials, that was for proportions. Or number of trials or sample size. That's right, you should all know that. N stands for sample size. So, and there was a magic number, it had to be bigger than what? 30. Very good, yeah, it had to be bigger than 30. If it wasn't bigger than 30, there was another thing that you could have up there that allowed you to have a sample size of less than or equal to 30, but still be able to do this z-score stuff. What was that? What's, nor what's normally distributed, though? The data. Okay, so the... the 
that it comes from a population that's normally distributed. Do you guys remember those those key pieces right here that uh, n was bigger than 30? If you if you had that, no problem. You can do whatever you want as far as the d score. If n wasn't bigger than 30, you had to have a statement. The population is normally distributed. Those things are, are, are key. You with me so far? Okay. Now we also talked about this word point estimate. Yep, back to normal. <laughs> And my one shot at glory. I was on the edge of glory. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only time in the history of the world I will ever use a Lady Gaga. <laughs> ever. Okay. We also talked about a point <laughs> estimate. I'm on the edge of glory. The sad part is I hear that at the gym every single freaking day, and it drives me absolutely up a wall. Because I like it. I like that. Anyway, point estimate. A point estimate was a single value from a sample that was used to represent the population. Do you remember that? P hat was the point estimate for P. Can you do a little thinking outside the box here and think, what's the point estimate going to be for mu? Mu is the population mean, right? Right? What's the point estimate going to be for mu? p-hat was a point estimate for p. Why? Because p-hat came from a sample. p was from a population. Of course, what you're trying to do is get a uh, piece of information, a statistic from a sample that's being used to represent a population. Are you with me on the idea of a point estimate? You absolutely must know what a point estimate is. If I say point estimate and you're like, I don't know, well, you're, you're out of the loop right now, folks. You're, you're, you're out of it. Um, you're out the game. Took you out the game with that. All right? So if I say point estimate, you've got to know that's a value from a statistic one single value being used to represent a population proportion or a population mean or a population some value of that. Uh, of course, we don't use those because we don't know how accurate they are. We have no way to say I'm certain amount confident. That's why we have a common central idea in the first place. You remember that? Watch 7.2 again. So here, when we used p hat to represent p, what are you going to use to represent mu? What does mu stand for? Mean for what? Population or sample? definitely a population. So we want something that is the same thing as this, only based on the sample. What do you use? XR. What's that? XR. Clearly, yeah. What's X bar stand for? Stand for a mean, right? What type of mean? Does it seem, does it seem reasonable that we're going to use the sample mean as a point estimate to represent the population mean? I hope so. It's just a sample mean. We say, oh yeah, take it from your sample. That's going to be your best guess. It's the single value that's, that you're going to assume is closest to your population mean. How accurate is it going to be? I don't know. That's why we do a confidence interval, because I don't know how good that is. But it's, a, it's where we start. Just like p hat represented the point estimate for p. Remember that from 7.2, right? That's what you did your homework on. x bar is going to be the point estimate for mu. Okay, again, why we use those conference intervals, we, we really do not have an idea about how good this is going to be as an estimate for this thing. That's why we give a range of data. We say, okay, I, I know this isn't going to be exactly accurate, but I'm going to give a range of data to which I'm a certain level of confidence, uh, confident that the actual value of mu is going to fall in that range. Do you remember the idea for that point estimate? Same basic principle. We're making up a range to which we're going to be a certain level of confidence that the actual value of our population parameter, in this case a, a mean, is going to fall in that range. What was the most common confidence levels, by the way? 90%. Great. What was the next one? And? Did you have those z-scores memorized? What were those z-scores called again? It wasn't called a z-score. It was called a critical value. Yeah. Those critical values, 
that's going to work the same as, this, as, as last time. Okay, so those critical values you memorized, they're still valid because we're still going to be using a Z critical value. Why are we using a Z? Because of this and because of this. This lets us use a Z critical value. So, without further ado, let's get right on down to the margin of error. Do you remember what letter represents the margin of error? <laughs> Very good. Now, of course, we're not dealing with a proportion anymore, so we're not going to have any more P hat, Q hat garbage. Uh, that was from the last section. But we are going to have the exact same formula. I want you to see this is kind of cool. The exact same formula with just different letters. I want you to think back to, don't, don't write this, well, you can write this <laughs> if you want to, but I'm going to change it. Think back to the last section. You had this. True? Okay. And what this was... What this was essentially, let's see if I can do my math right, uh, was, what was standard deviation for that? Was that PQN? Yeah, it was. This is basically Z alpha over 2 square root P hat Q hat over square root of N. Sure. What we're going to do is take this part of it, leave it alone, take this part of it and represent it, but not with proportions, but now with our mean and with our standard deviation. So instead of this being our margin of error, our margin of error looks really similar. It's still a z alpha over 2. We still have a standard deviation, very similar to that, and we still have a square root of n. It's, it's not exactly the same, but it's very similar. This right here is your margin of error for doing confidence intervals to try to represent your population mean when your sigma is known. Why does a sigma have to be known? Well, look at the formula. Where's sigma? Oh, it's right there. You've got to know it. If you don't know it, then you can't use the formula. So similar idea as this thing, just looks a little bit different. So our, our E, our margin of error, still represents the maximum difference between our point estimate and our population parameter. So in other words, it still estimates, uh, it still says the maximum difference between this number and what this one is. So it's going to still give us a range. So E is, let's say it one more time, critical value, sigma over the square root of n. What that means is if, if E is still the maximum difference between X bar and mu, do you, do you believe me that, that that's true? That's what the margin of error was actually defined to be. It's based on a certain level of confidence. So, for instance, if we use 90%, our, what's our Z value for 90%? Critical value? 1 point for 90%. 1.645. How about 95%? What was it? That's yeah, the most common one. And then for 99%, it was? That's still giving you more range the more confident that you, you want to be, right? That's how, it's, that's how you signify how confident you are. It's creating a larger range for how co more confidence. This right here, that's our standard deviation for the population divided by the square root of n. We've seen stuff like that before. That was earlier in our class. What this does is represents the maximum difference between x bar and mu for a given level of confidence. Again, can you ever be 100% confident? No. Ever? No. no, because it's going to go from negative infinity to infinity. You can't do that. But we can be a certain level of confidence, and here's how it works. If E is the maximum difference between these two numbers, then if I take x bar minus E, and I take x bar plus E, where x bar is my point estimate for mu, it says, well, check it out. 
this would give me an upper range for mu. This would give me a lower range for mu. If this is the maximum difference, I can say, well, then mu is supposed to not be any bigger than this or any smaller than this. That's what's giving me this nice bounds on my confidence interval. Does it look similar to what we've done before? It's exactly the same. Exactly the same. Only difference is instead of P being my population proportion, uh, population parameter, that's the proportion, we now have mu. It's still a population type deal, right? It's still the population parameter. It's just now we're talking about means instead, not proportions anymore. We still have, instead of P hat, we have X bar. That's the silly other thing on top, right? Saying I'm, I'm from a sample. X bar is our sample mean. This is the maximum difference above and below, giving us a nice interval to which we're a certain level of confidence that our actual population per, uh, parameters are fall in. Also, one last thing. Uh, remember that you can represent this as X bar plus or minus E. That's another way that you could potentially see that. So let me give you the steps here. They're going to be very similar to the last steps I gave you for these, these proportions in the last, last section, but I'll give it to you again. We'll go through an example, and then we'll find out how to find the required sample size like we did last time for a certain margin of error. You guys ready for it? Has it made sense so far? So first step. Well, the first thing you got to do, you got to have your requirements met, right? So you're going to check these things, what you need. You're going to check to see whether you have a random sample. If it's not stated, you're going to assume it's a random sample. Um, we, we've already covered all that stuff before. We're going to check to see whether you, you have your sigma known. It's got to say up there, assume the population standard deviation is. You've got to have that. And then we're going to see whether our sample size is bigger than 30. If it is, great. If it's not, we have to have this statement. The population is normally distributed. We've got to check those requirements. First thing, check requirements. They've got to be met. Number two, you're going to find your critical value. It's going to have a level of confidence. It's going to say 90% or 95% or 99% most likely. If it says something else like 98 or 96, you got some of those on your homework, right? You had to actually look that up in the table. You had to split that up and say, well, for 98, it would be 0.01. You take your 0 0.02 divided by 2. You look at 0.01, it'll give you a certain z. So somehow, we're going to find our critical value. So that's that z alpha over 2 for a certain confidence level. <laughs> Critical value for the given confidence level. Third thing, well, after you have that, after you have your critical value, well, you're going to know your, your sigma because it's going to be listing your problem. You're also going to know your n. What's your n stand for again? Yeah, in this context, it's not number of trials because we're not dealing with a proportion. We, we don't have that anymore. Right now, it's your, it's your sample size. So n stands for either a sample size or the number of trials. So for us, we're going to have this, we're going to have this, we're, you've just found that, that means you're able to find your E. So the next step is you're going to find your E. <clears throat> Once you have your E, you're set. You're set. You're going to have your X bar, it's going to be listed somewhere in your problem. You'll be able to make up your confidence in it. And I'll write out the interpretation in just a moment, but remember what the interpretation is of this thing, this confidence interval. Basically, it says this. And this is, this is a quote. Remember I had you write down that quote a while back? I said, quote, um, I don't know what the exact value 
of the population mean is. No, we're talking about mean now. I don't know what the exact value of population mean is, but I am blank percent confident, 90, 95, 99, percent confident that will, it will fall in this range. Does that make sense? That's what we've been having for, for the past couple of weeks now. Would you like to see an example? Good. <coughs> you guys ever measured your resting pulse rate? Have you ever measured that? Yeah. You sit there like you, you wake up and you're like, I'm tired. I'm going to measure my pulse. That happens to me every morning. It's the first thing I want to do. No, I'm just kidding. I don't ever do that. Uh, but they ask you to do that to see what your resting heart rate is. It tells you apparently uh, if you're healthier or whatever. Uh, usually if you, you exercise a lot, you'll have a lower resting heart rate uh, than if, if you don't. Normally that's what happens. Uh, so in general, though, this is what was done. They took a sample. of 40 students. Here's how this is going to be worded on your test. The average resting heart rate for the sample was 76.3 beats per minute. so far? Okay. Assume the population, standard deviation, is 12.5 beats per minute. What I want us to do is construct a 99% confidence interval for the population mean of, of resting heart rate. Construct a 99% confidence interval for the average resting heart rate of the population. Hey, test qu homework question, test qu or just like it, very, very similar. That's the wording. And if you don't know how to diagnose this, you're going to get stuck, right? You're going to read that and go, oh my gosh, there's like 50 <coughs> words there. How am I supposed to know what to do? I have to read. I hate reading in math class. Come on. I see numbers. I see only, I see four numbers. That's all I see. What am I going to do with this problem? Random sample of 40 students. The average resting heart rate for the sample was 76.3 beats per minute. Assume the population standard deviation is 12.5 beats per minute. Construct a 99% confidence interval for the average resting heart rate of the population. Wow. You better be able to tell what each of those things mean. Now we're going to go through our steps. That's why I gave you steps. First thing you got to do, you got to check the requirements. Now you have your requirements on your paper probably, right? Firstly, what the first requirement was what? Is the first requirement met? Do I have a random sample? I uh, even said specifically I had a random sample. Even if I hadn't said random, you're going to assume it's a random sample. Number two, unless it says specifically this sample was not random. Okay, then you, you put your hand on it. <laughs> this was just my buddies. Um, so for, like, for instance, a, a non-random sample would be uh, if they went to a college and somehow 
just selected all the people who ran track. Naturally, they're going to have very low resting heart rates, right? It's, that's not random. That doesn't do all of you run track? That'd be really weird if y'all did. Uh, no, y'all don't. Okay, so number one requirement is met. Number two, the second requirement was, what was the second requirement? The population standard deviation must be known. The population standard deviation must be known. Is that anywhere up there? Yeah. Where does it say it? Well, no, but where, where, where's the sentence? What's the sentence say specifically? <laughs> Bam. Okay. Assume the population standard deviation is. That has to be there. Has to be there. It should say somewhere population standard deviation is or sigma is. I mean, that's even more blatant, right? Just in your face. Sigma is this. That'd be nice. It doesn't say that here. I'm making it as hard as I can. That way I give you, you know, everything else will be easier than this. It's about as hard as I can make it for you because you have to read through and diagnose everything about it. So this, assume the population derivation is 12.5 beats per minute. It gives you the sigma. So is requirement 2 met? Yeah. If requirement 2 wasn't met, could I do the stuff I'm about to do? Mm -hmm. Answer's no. No, we'd have to find something else. That's the next section. The third requirement is what? Yeah, what's N stand for again? Okay, so sample size must be what? Okay, or what if it's not? The population must be normally distributed. That's what it has to say. Okay, so let's read through here. Is the sample size more than 30? Where does it say that? Ah, in a sample of 40. Sample means N, N means sample. Sample of 40 students, is that more than 30? Yeah, yeah. I know that 40 is more than 30. That's great. Forty dollars more than thirty dollars. So we have the requirement met for that. Now, if this had said twenty-nine, if this had said thirty, if that had said twenty-nine, thirty, fifteen, I would need another statement before we can move on any further. It would have to say somewhere in here the population is normally distributed. Are you clear on that? So the, the same requirements we've had from before. It's got to be there. Now, if that's the case, what we, we've done number one. The second thing we got to do, we got to identify our critical value. That's our, our z alpha over 2, and it's going to come from the confidence level. In this case, can you tell me what the confidence level is? 99%. 99% confidence level, very good. Can you tell me the critical value for a 99% confidence level? 2.575. Very good. 2.575. Now, the next part says we're supposed to find E, but there's a couple of the letters we need to signify. So before we get to our E, not only are we going to have a Z alpha over 2, because that's part of it, I also want you to explicitly list out, that means put that on your paper, your sigma and your N, because you need those things. Firstly, can you tell me what your N is? Can you tell me what the sigma is? Now, before you go any further, stop. There's also one more number. <coughs> Do you see it? Do you see it? It says the 76. Point, we haven't put that on paper yet. 76.3. What is 76.3? Why isn't it you? It says what now? The sample mean. Are we ever going to know mu? No. If we knew mu, we wouldn't even have to do the problem, right? Because yeah. we're actually trying to estimate mu. You, you follow? Mm -hmm. So if you knew mu, why would you even do this? You'd be like, oh, the, the mu is 30. I, I'm 95% confident it falls between, well, yeah, you're 100% confident. You already know mu. Well, why would you even do this problem, right? So you're never going to know mu. You are going to know x bar. So from here we're going to find our E. I know that our E is this formula. What I'd like to do on your own, I'll give you 10 seconds, fill that formula out for me. So you take your critical value, you multiply that by your population standard deviation <coughs> divided by the square root, don't forget the square root, of your sample size. So 
So we should have the 2.575. should have a fraction. 12.5 goes on the numerator. The square root of 40 goes on the denominator. Give me a little head nod if you got that far. Good, just substitute stuff in now. Uh, of course, we're not going to, we're not, definitely not going to round any of this stuff. If you start rounding things, your confidence interval is going to be off uh, by a little bit. Try to do this without rounding. If you'd like to do this without rounding, there's a couple ways you can. Uh, first thing you might want to do, you could figure out the square root of 40 and store that in your memory. That's, that's one thing you could do. Uh, you have a memory button on every calculator. Or, if you have one of your graphing calculators, take 2.575, multiply by 12.5, press enter, then press divide, put square root of 40, press enter. It'll give it to you without writing anything down. Have you done that? So you're working on it, working on it. Officer, do you something? Yeah. What'd you get? What'd you get? 5.08. 5 5.08. 5.08? 5 5 5 so some confidence, officer. Come on, you got it right. But 5.08. <laughs> Triumphant. Yeah, 5.08. Wait, wait, wait a second. Can this be greater than 1? No. Wait a second. Wait, wait. Can this be greater than one? Are we dealing with proportions? Then that's a requirement that we don't have to keep. So if you're going, well, wait a second, all my means are more than one. Yeah, the means. You're not dealing with proportions anymore. So you don't have to be between zero and one anymore. You, you follow me on that? So E here is 5.01. <coughs> Okay, and yet show of hands if everyone's okay on getting that far. Raise your hand if you are. Yes, no? You guys on the left hand side? Alright. What do you do with that 5.08? What do you do now? Should say up there. Okay. Great. This should be very similar to what you did with your proportions, right? You took your p hat, you added e, and you subtracted e. Now we're not dealing with p hat, but we are dealing with x bar. You're going to take x bar, you're going to subtract e, and you're going to add e. That's going to create an interval for you. You see, this is the maximum difference allowable with a 99% confidence level uh, for this, this information. So we say, all right, if our point estimate is 76.3, I know that our confidence interval must be 76.3 minus our E, 5.08. All the way to 76.3 plus our E. So if you do the math right, let's see. That should be... 71.3, sorry, 2, 2. And here we should get, what was that? Let me do a very short, like, 30 second recap. Here's the idea. Hopefully you've seen the similarity between the proportions that we dealt with a couple times ago, and these means. We're still having to find a critical value. We still got to do that. We're still finding our population proportion. We, we do it without the p hat and the q hat because we're not doing proportions anymore. We still have a sample size, and we still have a point estimate. Only this time, our point estimate isn't p hat, it's x bar. Because we're dealing with means now. We still find our e. It's still a critical value times the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. We're still doing that. The standard deviation is now only explicitly given to you. That's kind of nice. We still take that e, we add it to our point estimate. No problem. That's here. We subtract it from our point estimate, and that gives us a range of numbers. That gives us our confidence interval. How confident are we? So our interpretation is, is this, if you want to write this down again in, in quotations. <coughs> Don't know what the exact value of the population mean is. 
I don't know what the exact value of the population mean is. But I am 99% sure, or 99% confident, I'm 99% sure it will fall in this range between 71.2 beats per minute and 81.4 beats per minute. I don't know what the actual value is, but I'm 99% sure <coughs> it's going to be between 71 and 81, basically. Does that make sense to you? How many people feel pretty good about this so far? Good deal. Now, last thing we got to talk about, uh, remember the last time we could actually find the required sample size to get a certain margin of error? You remember that? It was kind of cool. It was like, well, I only want a 4% margin of error. I can figure out what the sample size needs to be. We can do the same thing with this. We'll do a little bit of algebra, we'll do one example, and then we'll wrap up our section here. <laughs> so find the required sample size. for a given margin of error. <coughs> Let's see if we can do that. Remember last time we solved everything for n, right? You remember that? So we're going to use our, our E. We're going to solve that thing for n. So my algebra people, how are you going to do it? Get n by itself. What's the first, first step? This is being multiplied. Let's divide everything by z alpha over 2. What you're going to get is e over z alpha over 2 equals sigma the square root n. Still okay with that? You sure? Okay. What's that next thing I could do? Multiply what? Hmm? I don't want to multiply sigma, it's already being multiplied by sigma squared up there. I could divide that. Remember, I'm, I'm trying to get n by itself, right? I want to eliminate everything around n. Uh, one thing you can do here, it, you could reciprocate everything if you, if you want to. Uh, you take both sides of negative one power that would reciprocate both fractions, that's legal to do. So <coughs> this, you can actually just go, oh, same thing. Fancy algebra, isn't it? True statement. True statement. Well, at least I hope so. Otherwise, I've been doing math wrong my whole life. Still want to get n by itself. What else do I need to get rid of? Sigma. Now I can multiply both sides by sigma. I'll get z alpha over 2 times sigma over e equals the square root of n. Now, the square root of n isn't good enough. How do I get rid of the square root of n? Squareable sides, that's going to give me n equals, I'm going to flip sides on you, n equals z alpha over 2 times sigma all over e squared. It's a little bit different than the other formulas. The other formulas, you, you square these two things individually, and you multiply <coughs> by p hat, q hat, you're not going to do that now. You multiply everything all together, but do not forget to square it. If you forget to square it, you'll get the square root of the appropriate sample size. Instead of a sample size of 81, you'll get 9. Okay, you don't want to do that. So make sure you're squaring that number at the very end. Shall we do an example? Mm -hmm. Okay. So our example here, we want to construct a 95% confidence interval.
for the average of IQ scores. We want to construct a 95% compensator for the average or mean of IQ scores. We've got to assume the population standard deviation is 15. And I want the sample mean to be within two points of the population. How big does that sample have to be? <clears throat> oh my, okay, there's lots of stuff going on. Let's read through here carefully, then we'll do the math and figure this thing out. Firstly, we want to construct it. What, what do we want to construct? What type of compensation rule? 95 percent. That should tell you something, right? Okay. For the mean of IQ scores, the mean of IQ scores, that means the population IQ scores, so that means for mu. We're trying to find a compensation for, for mu. But these people are stuck. You see, they need to find out the sample first. They haven't taken any samples, so we're not actually going to be finding the compensation interval here. We're just going to give them the first step and say, you need to go out and take a sample of this many people. Are you with me on that? That's how you do it in real life. You say, well, I want to be within two points of the mean. Tell me how big my sample has to be. That's what you're going to do. Then you're going to find your sample, calculate everything, and you're going to know inherently that that confidence interval is going to be within two points of your population mean for 90, being 95% confident. Are you okay with this, folks? All right, great. Okay, assume the population standard deviation is 15. Is that important? That's probably pretty important because when we look up here, we're going to need sigma somewhere, right? We're going to need a critical value somewhere. Could you tell me right now what our critical value is? I hope so. Yeah, sure. It's based on your confidence level. We needed that. Also, we need our E. Now, it says a little bit further, I want the sample mean to be within two points of the population. What's that mean? I don't have mean, mean. What's it mean? I have the sample mean. I want it to be within two points of the population mean. Within two points means the maximum difference between them has to be what? Two. Has to be two. So what's my margin of error? Two. Now, the question, is it two? Is it point two? Or is it point zero two? Are we dealing with proportions? Is that two percent or two points? If I had said 2%, we'd be dealing with proportions, and you'd be doing 0 0.02. Are you with me on that? I'm not dealing with proportions, so you have to get that out of your head. You are in two distinct sections here. You're either doing proportions, percentages, great, 0 0.02, right? It's going to say percent. Or you're going to be dealing with means. You don't change that to a decimal because it's not. It's not a percentage. It says points. So that 2, that's 2 points. So let's go ahead and let's verify all this information. Can you tell me again? If we're trying to find out sample size, that's what this says, how big the sample need to be. Tell me what my z alpha over 2 has to be one more time. And where are you finding that? 3. So 95% gives you 1.96. And our and do we know our n yet? No, that's what we're trying to find. Okay, do we know our sigma? Great. Sigma stands for population standard deviation. It said that right up there, assume it to be 15. That's awesome. And last thing we need to know, what's your E? 0.02 or 2? Two. 2. 2 points. So be very, very careful, especially on a test. These problems are going to be worded really similarly, right? 
it sounds the same as the stuff we just did. It is the same. It's just you're in a different category. You're not dealing with proportions anymore, you're dealing with means. So the, the, the easy part about this is also the hard part about this. It's easy because this is literally identical to the last section, right? It's hard because it's almost identical to the last section. But there's differences in there. So let's go ahead and try to figure this stuff out. We got n equals, well, we're going to have z alpha over 2 times our sigma all over our e. And then after that, we're going to square it all. So let's fill out that formula. Go ahead, take 10 seconds, try to do it yourself. See if you can get that. One point nine six. That's our critical value. Sigma. That's our standard deviation for the population. That's fifteen. We got that. Our e is two points, so we're going to put two. We just cannot forget to square it. So how to do this in one fell swoop without rounding at all? Take one point nine six on your calculator, multiply by fifteen, press enter, divide by two, press enter, then square it, press enter, and you'll get how much do you get exactly? I heard mumbling. What was it again? How many were able to find 216.09? Good for you. Okay. What's that mean about our sample size? I make the joke all the time. We're going to find 0 .09 of a person. Say 216 of you, and your hand will answer this time. That's about 0 .09. No. What's our sample size going to be then? Why not 16? It's too small. We need just a little bit more than that. You're not going to take part of a person, so you have to bump that up. If you get a decimal, you got to bump that up by one. So our sample size is going to be 217. Again, what this does for you, this says if you go out there with this information, and if you want to instruct a 95% confidence interval right now, you've got to go out and take 217 people find out their IQ scores, and then that is going to, going to be guaranteed within two points of the actual population IQ score. Does that make sense? You're not going to be exactly sure what the population IQ score is, but you're going to be 95% sure it's within the range that you, you find out after you take your sample. We can't go any further because we don't have the sample mean here, right? It's not giving you that. We just found out what the sample had to be so they could go find that mean and then use the information. How many people understood this, this section? Good. Now I'll give you a little preview in the last minute that we have. Is it going to be common for you to actually know the population standard deviation? So I want you to think about what we're doing here, really. We're estimating the population mean, right? But it's assumed that you know the population standard deviation, which inherently you would need to know the population mean in order to do. Do you realize that? Population standard deviation is based on the mean. So, how are you going to know the population deviation if you don't know the population mean? Probably not. This is a very rare case. Right? It's very rare that you're actually going to know that, the population deviation. So, the next section, what we're going to do, this little preview, will be exactly the same as this. Only, we're not going to be able to use the z-score. We can't because we're not going to know the population deviation. That's actually a more realistic case. We'll take a look at that next time.